to Dice Tower Tonight the first time. Welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, Tom and I play show and tell with a few recent games, recap our experiences with our trips to Gen Con, Grand Con, and Halcon, and then take your questions live. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Max Headroom of board gaming, Tom Vassell. I feel like you uh, said I had a big head there. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I was saying. So, folks, welcome to Dice Tower tonight. This is actually, we're usually going to do this every other week, but for this first episode, we'll be doing episode two next Wednesday. That Just so that we can, we can figure it out faster, I think, is the idea. It's also because I didn't want to wait two weeks because we missed, <laughs> there's just been a lot of stuff. So stuff, Stuff's a good word for it, yeah. Stuff yeah. is a good word for it. So a couple things. First of all, this is going to be a video show that we're posting every other week, and we will be putting up an audio version of this on our feed probably closer to, like, Monday of next week. Hmm. Uh, we'll usually post it right before Suzanne and Mandy's episode. So anyhow, when, once we post that, I think that's right, or the same way, we'll post it somewhere around. <laughs> Just keep an eye out for that. But realize that we're still learning. We did a practice run of this earlier in which I learned some things about microphones. We but did, also, yes. We also got some new webcams, so hopefully you can tell the difference between these. Um, so anyhow, what we're going to do, and we'll try to, we're going to, this is going to, this is our model for this episode. Uh, we can see the chat, but we're not going to be answering every question that you have right now, at least. What we're going to be doing is Eric and I will go back and forth talking uh, about different games, and we will, if you have a question about that specific game, that's the time to ask it. And, you know, so if you want to know more about that game, and we'll just go back and forth, and then when we're done with that, we have a short discussion topic, and then we'll open up for general questions, and then Eric and I will go to bed because we're old men. Yep, pretty much. I think I covered that. I, th I think that's the plan, at least, yeah. All right, so I'm going to start first with a game here. This is a small game here called Strawberry Ninja. Ooh. Now, this is not one of the games you picked, is it? No, no, it's not. Please continue. Okay, good. All right, so Strawberry Ninja is from uh, Strawberry Studio, which is a big surprise. Uh, their first game was Three Wishes. Did you play Three Wishes? Oh, yeah, I know the game, yeah. Wait, you played it at Origins with us. I don't think I played it with you. That was we somebody else. Was we stayed up late in the room playing no, games. No, I was not invited to that. You went to bed early. Okay, so anyway, Strawberry Ninja is a cooperative family game in which you have a bunch of cards that are face down, and one of them is a Strawberry Ninja and there's also a, uh, oh, what is the thing moving around the board? A cat. So you're trying to catch a strawberry ninja with a cat. Now, normally I'm opposed to cats in life and in games. But I hate strawberry ninjas more than cats. Because a strawberry I don't even, what is a strawberry ninja doing? <laughs> is it stealing strawberries or is it made of strawberries? No, it... Because we're growing strawberries in the garden outside, and little, like, chipmunks keep stealing them. You tell me. That is, that is a ninja strawberry, isn't it? Okay, so he's going around the garden, and he's stealing stuff. Okay, so okay. Um, your cat is trying to stop him. So basically, you have a bunch of cards that are face down, and then there's these movement cards. I don't know why. I keep forgetting we're on video here. <laughs> we should actually show <laughs> there's these There's these movement cards. So you have these different cards that are face down, and you're looking for the... The strawberry ninja, but you, this is just a strawberry guard. I don't know why he's in the garden. But you have these movement cards, like move kitty right, left, you know, up and down. And so you're going to be moving the kitten, and then you move one of the cards. It, you, like, move them like, a, you know, that puzzle with a piece missing and you slide it around? Yeah, yeah. And you're trying to make it so that the ninja and the cat land in the same space. And so it's kind of fun, and, and these cards, they don't change direction, except that every once in a while you'll, you'll do something that makes you shuffle them. But since they don't change, you know how the cat's going to be moving around. Oh. And when you do the cards, different things will happen. Like, you may not shift this card. So this uh, pile of, I think those are pumpkins, but they look like bones. Those are um, evil pumpkins. Yes. Um, but I, let's see. Here's one. Uh, switch the top two cards and move a deck. You can only shift this card up or down. If you find the donut, kitty goes there immediately, which makes sense. Um, cats so, love donuts. Or, like, here's a gopher hole, and you can go from one gopher hole to another. So if you catch the uh, kitty before a certain number of turns are up, you win. Otherwise, you lose. So I like it. It's definitely geared towards kids and families. Um, it's not that hard of a game. I mean, it, and there's a lot of luck involved in it. But there's one problem with the game, even though I like it, 
And that's that I think this is a truly solitaire game. In which I mean it's a co-op game like I move a card, you move a card, you move a card. But literally one person could do that. Mm-hmm. I know this because I played it solitaire. And the only difference <laughs> was my kids weren't yeah. making annoying choices. So therefore I did much better. <laughs> okay. So you know what I mean? It's like a pure co-op game. So if someone wants to quarterback the whole thing, they they can. Um, so that's Strawberry Ninja. Uh, I, I like it, but I, mostly for kids. Let me quick check here to see if anyone asks any questions specifically about Strawberry Ninja. And I am not seeing any, so... Yeah. They all just want to know about the hat that you have behind you. Like, why is there it's just like a hat the, sitting there? Why is there just a hat there? Yeah. Because that's the hat I was wearing, but even though I don't have a lot of fashion sense, you're technically not supposed to wear a red hat with an orange shirt. I do know that. Yeah. I don't care for the most part, but I saw this white hat sitting up on my thing, and I was like, ah, I'll just wear the white hat. Now your head blends into the background, though. It's pretty nice. No, there you go. Fine, Eric. (laughs) All right. The idea wasn't to criticize your fashion choice, no. Okay, so anyway, what do the cards taste like? Someone wants to know. Now, are there any scratch and sniff games? No, there are, aren't there? It just tastes like an ordinary card. Who's going to buy the game now? <laughs> all right, all right. No one has any questions about me, so uh, let's uh, let's go to Eric. What's your first all game? Right. I, I went to Target recently and, and got one of their exclusive uh, Target releases because there's a whole bunch of them there. And here we go. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? That's why you no. wanted me to wear the hat. I... I didn't know that this happens when you when you open the game, but um, so the rule book. Here's the rule book. Uh, you open it up and it goes. The rule book sings to you. Okay. You'd say you bought the game and you didn't know that. I did not know it would do that. I was hoping it would do that, but I really didn't think it would do that. If, so, if, the, if, if Carmen San Diego show did not have that song, would you like it? It had a goofy humor. I, I enjoyed it as it was. But, I mean, Rockapella really made that show. Anyway, so in Carmen San Diego, you're trying to catch Carmen, obviously. It's not a co-op, though. You're, you're working against the other players to do so faster. Uh, you've got three types of cards. You've got um, henchmen, like Fast Eddie B. Or th- some of these are puns. You'll be sorry. That's um, really bad. <laughs> uh, and then you've got... Uh, loot cards, like the elevator from the Eiffel Tower, and of course that comes from Paris, because there are locations as well, uh, and they're all arranged in sort of a grid, and you're trying to match um, the loot and the location by peeking at cards. Each turn you get to look at one of the cards, and you sort of create a, an idea of where all the cards are, and you even have a little notebook here that you're filling out with a dry erase pen and uh, writing down where you know different cards are. And you're trying to find matches of the, the ultimate goal is that there's a strip of cards in the center that's a loot and a location and a villain. And you're trying to get a matching pair into the center and know where Carmen is so that you can say, I know that this is the elevator from the Eiffel Tower and it's from Paris and they're both in the middle and Carmen is right in front of you and you win. Um, and you do this by manipulating the cards around and knowing what they all are. Um, it's, it's not terrible. Um, it has a certain nostalgic feel. This gets major points for its its feel, its um, its aesthetic, and the fact that the rule book sings to you. It is sort of an exercise in note taking. That's really all it is. And there's a die that tells you what type of card you're allowed to look at at any given moment. Uh, and if you keep rolling the same type of card, you're going to find out what say all of the loot cards are. But then you you have no other thing to do if you keep rolling loot cards. Um, you're sort of at the mercy of the die roll in order to figure out what's going on. And whoever does figure out what's going on, there's still a puzzle in the machinations of moving the cards around. Every time you make a match, you then get to move a card into the center. So you're trying to get a matching pair in there. So that's interesting and a little tricky. Um, But if everybody takes perfect notes, it's not as interesting a game as it could be. Mm. Um, it It is not the geographical educational experience that Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, the original game was. So I was a little disappointed on that front. It, again, 
you know, these licensed games can be absolute garbage. And this is not that. It's just not quite as in-depth as I was hoping it would be. Um, so it's a, it's a middling rating from me for where in the world is Carmen San Diego. But the I graphics bet are I cool. bet your kids don't understand this obsession with Carmen San Diego. Um, they wouldn't if I didn't play rock cappella songs all the time. We actually have a playlist of all four versions of the Where in the World is Carmen San Diego theme. So, yeah, they know. They know of the rock cappella. I like that song, too, and it's on my playtest also, but I don't have four versions of it. Well, there are four, uh, and yeah, they're all yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. There's Carmen. I found Carmen. Well, I okay, that's the only question. Uh, let's see. We got some questions. How long has she been missing? How long has Carmen been missing? Yes. Uh, 1985, Eric. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, like originally. That's 22 years. 1980. Actually, so how much replayability? Is there a limited number of scenarios, or is it randomized like Clue, says Scott? It's, it's totally randomized like Clue. You, you've got the, these, these cards, and they all get shuffled up and distributed amongst all the players. Um, and as matches are made, new cards come into the system. Eventually, you'll run out of the deck, and you'll someone will know where Carmen is, and and work it all out because cards keep getting removed from the system. But it's totally random, like Clue, each time you set it up. All right. Okay, the next game for me is Azul. Now, this is a Ooh. new game. Oh, you know about this game? I I've seen pictures of it. The pieces look gorgeous. Yeah, it's from Plan B Games. Let me show you these pieces because. I'm really liking this video part of the show here. We can actually... Like, I don't have to guess what you're talking about. So you hear this exactly. clinking. Now the bag... Ah. I, I like I like this game this look, kind of, sort of. The box is okay, right? I'm not as keen on the inside. Like this blue... This looks like Grandma designed something and wouldn't let it go in the 60s. Um, <laughs> but the game comes with a bunch of tiles. And so they're very nice they're that backlight you know that that material that everyone loves yeah. feeling that and so they look like really expensive chocolates what you're trying to do is you're trying to fill up this board here all right and so everyone has the same board although you can also play with a blank board if you want but you're trying to get the most points and so the way that works is there's a bunch of these circles in the middle of the table each has a certain number of tiles on that circle randomly drawn from the bag the number of circles is based on the number of players when it's your turn you take all the tiles of one color off of a circle. So if there's two blues and a red, you take both the blues. The tiles that you don't take go to the middle of the table. Um, and so when you're taking a group of tiles, you can also take from the middle of the table, but you have to take every tile of one color, even if you don't want that many of a color. When you take these tiles of a color, you fill up these rows here. So if I take one red, I might stick it in the top row. If I take three blue, I might stick it here, but I also might stick three blue here. If you ever have to take a color and it goes over the row, you put the extra ones down here where you're going to lose points. So you don't want to do that, and no. you will do that much more in a two-player game than in a four-player game. So after everyone has finished taking all the tiles, because you take them all, someone's going to get them, then the if you fill up the whole row, one tile of that color slides across to wherever that is. So once you fill in the red here, you can't put red in this row anymore. So as you're sliding these tiles in, they can, go any, they can go on their specific spot. And then you also will score points based on, like this one here, you'll score point. Let's say this blue tile was here and this blue tile was here. And then I put the orange one here. It would get two points for that row and two points for that column. So a little similar to ingenious scoring, kind of. Okay. So as you fill these in and you drop one in the middle, you can score a whole pile of points. Then at the end of the game, you're going to get points if you fill a whole column or fill a whole row or if you fill all five of the same color. And then whoever has most points wins. When someone fills a whole, is it the whole row or the whole column? It's the whole row. When someone fills the whole row, then that ends the game. One, one of their rows. It's really good. The whole, the whole neat thing is about these circles, right? Like you'll take this and you'll be like, ah, oh, I wanted those two blues. And now you move that to the middle. Now there's four reds there, but I only need two. Do I want to take these extra two reds and give me negative points? And, it, and because it has that same... I call it the mahjong effect, mahjong mm -hmm. effect, or, you know, as you, that clinking of those things just feels good. You know, just clinking the yep, tiles and yep, moving yep. them around and putting them on your board, it feels good. And it's just really fun to try to, you know, you'll be like, all right, let's go for this big one. I can take a lot of tiles and slide one across, but it's faster to do this top row. But if you put a blue in that top row and later on you're forced to take blues and all your other rows are filled with different colors, you're really in trouble by taking these negative points. 
There's also mm -hmm. a first player marker, and you can take that first player marker, which means next turn you get to choose first. But that first player marker fills in one of these spots here that makes you lose points. Oh. Ah, that's an interesting yeah. thing. So that is Azul. That's from uh, Plan B Games. That's their newest game. Um, I'm probably not going to be doing a full review on the Dice Tower, but Z Garcia did a review of it. I believe that went up or is going up sometime this week. So let's see if there's any questions about Azul. Does it have solo rules? Let's see. <laughs> Variant play, end of the game, prepping the next round, give each player a player board. I don't see solo rules in here. What does it say on here? It says two to four, so no. Um, and this game is called Blue, translated from Spanish. Well, I yes, I am. But, yes, yes. I, that's true, and that would explain why there's so much blue <clears throat> on the yes. cover here. Although there's not on this cover. Well, there is blue on it. True, but this should be called Azul y Naranja. Um, Naranja? Is that Naranja? Roja. Not huh? Roja. Roja is not orange. Oh, not it's orange. Naranja. Oh, it's orange. Red. No, it's orange. red. Okay, whatever. I can't tell. Uh, let's see, Your any shirt. other questions? My shirt is orange. You get that, right? Yes. And that hat Your is shirt red. Is not the same. Yes. And, and, and face is, is, is something in the middle. Is it available now? No, it's not available yet, but it's coming out really, really soon. Um, I, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So it reminds you a little bit of Colorado. Someone says, yeah, that's actually a, a pretty legitimate comparison. All right. Let's go to Eric's game okay. number two. Yeah. So this is one that I was super excited about at Gen Con. It made my top ten most anticipated games list, and Tom tried to warn me off of three secrets this is uh, another one of those um guess the situation games it's just a deck of cards and uh they're, they're nice large cards but you've well, got a situation. show us one Sh I show us oh I sorry it out um so you've got this is what you show to all the players one player knows what's going on and the other players are trying to guess what the situation is and you'll notice that there are three highlighted elements of the card those are hat, the three secrets. Bushes and something else. And it's a, it's a train in the background. And so the, the other player is looking at the situation, and they know what's going on. Um, so you're supposed to ask yes and no questions. There's a timer app that, that goes along with this. Um, and so time is ticking down, um, and you have that much time to guess all three secrets. Once you've, you, once you've guessed one of them, you then get to move on. Oh, yes, it's, it's divided into the three secrets. So there's one timer for one secret and then one timer for the next one. Um, so once you've guessed one of the secrets, then you start the timer for the next, next one, and you have to then move through all those hurdles before you can win. The clue giver is only saying yes or no, and I guess you can say, uh, you know, not applicable and stuff like that. You can also give a clue. And if you give a clue you cut the amount of time left for that secret in half. Right, so, so if, you could if, wait till like, there's 10 seconds left, you might as well give the clue then. Right, yes, but then you have five seconds left to, to, to answer. Um, well, I, I find it interesting that they've structured the game this way. I don't feel like seeing these elements, like looking at this picture, doesn't help very much in solving the mystery at all. It's not like there's there's hidden things to look for in this illustration. It, it may give you a general sense of what direction to start questioning, but you see that train there. What are you supposed to ask about the train? It's not like there's a specific detail that you're looking for. And sometimes these answers are way off the wall and the illustration doesn't help at all. Um, I'm not gonna spoil it just because I don't, I don't think that's a great idea, but just seeing that picture doesn't push you in the direction um, in, in asking what's happening. Right, I'm gonna guess, I, I think, I think that that um, that guy you said there's a train in the background, right? Yep. Okay, so he just got back from a convention where he stole a pile of hats. Uh, He's yep, wearing yep. one of the nicer hats, and on that train is his family who are leaving the country because this man has an unhealthy obsession with hats. They're leaving, and he's sad, and so he's going to go murder his brother. Um, you're that close, really. It was Goodness. really really close uh, so a lot of the the mysteries are about the motivation of the character in the illustration and you can't tell why he's upset or sad or wants to be alone in this 
it, it just it it doesn't have a connection to what you're trying to figure out and i i found it frustrating i felt like i explained it ex conclusively you yeah you tried to warn me i do think dark stories is a better system um i was just i found out that dark stories has other decks not in english but that aren't so dark they're more family friendly mysteries. Light That's stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're actually pink stories and blue stories and purple stories that, you know, aren't so much about murder and, and terrible situations that I could play with my kids. And this one does not fit that bill, unfortunately. That's three secrets. Okay. But I think we could say to someone just today, they don't like dark stories. If you don't like dark stories, I don't think you'll really not like this one. This isn't gonna. This isn't gonna fix it. I found this more frustrating from a puzzle perspective, and the subject matter is not that much less dark here. I had to skip a few cards. I was playing with my kids and had to skip a few cards just because of the subject matter. I didn't think they'd be able to. That they'd want to head in that proper direction. Well, my biggest problem with the game was just that that picture often didn't seem like it corresponded with the story much at all. No. No, it just, it doesn't. No, eh. it's frustrating. All right. So, yeah, it's someone has it's a one-time game. It's one time per picture. I mean, once you go right. through all the There's pictures, you're done. How many cards? It's a bunch. It's, here, let me bring it out again. <laughs> that was, that was a useful number. So how many, <laughs> how much money are you going to give me? A bunch. A bunch. Say so it's a, you know, it's a good stack of cards. And they actually come in different uh, levels of difficulty. Those are just the green ones that are already frustrating. Oh, the, yeah, no. There's, the red. there's red and blue and orange and yeah, it's... No, no. Sorry, got to pass on this one. Who would you recommend this game to, says Phil? Certainly adults. Um, if, if you really, like we had our, our top 10 create games for creative people. If you really like thinking off the wall, um, but I, I don't, I would recommend Dark Stories over this in almost every circumstance. All right. Well, my next game here is Princess Jing. Have you seen this one at all? This I is not. from Matago, so you know that it has to be at least Matigo. something good. So this game here, apparently you are controlling a princess who is in love with a palace guard, and so she wants to run and meet him for uh, an evening of kissy kissy, or whatever kissy, it is. Kissy kissy. Um, and the other player also is a princess, and your princesses are in love with the opponent's guards. So you are trying to get your guard, but what's going to happen is you have these pieces here. So if you see this, this piece, um, you can hide someone in here. Let me see if I can find the characters. Here they are. So here's a guard. So if I stick him in... Oh, wait, actually, the guard doesn't go in those pieces. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Do they actually wedge in there? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah. here's the princess, okay. so... So you can see here, but if yep. she's on this side of the board, you can see, even if you're looking at it from like an angle, you can't see that the princess is there. Right. Now, you're going to be moving pieces around the board. And one of the pieces that you can move is this chap. If you've noticed, that's shiny. Why? Because he has a mirror. Mirror. So if you can get him into a location, and let's see if I can... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do this for the camera here. <laughs> So you're looking, and... I'm looking at a wall. Yep, that's not any better. Oh, wait, hang on. If I look through the thing, it's a big old light glare. Wait. Wait, I see a blurry pink image. I see... Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it works in real life. So you look through this hole on the top, and as you're moving around your mirror, dude, you might see the princess. Each person has three pieces. You have this mirror guy. You have the princess. And, well, this is actually not the princess. This is the the decoy. This is uh, the princess. Okay. It's like, it's like Princess Amidala all over. Right. The, yes. It's it's Star Wars Episode One. So if you get your princess to the opponent's guard, you win. If at any point you think you know where the princess is, you can be like, "This is the princess," but don't be wrong, because then your opponent gets free moves. And so you also have to be careful when you're moving your mirror guy, because you're trying to look at th at your mirror, but not be so obvious where your mirror is. So I'm like staring at the side of the board like, what are you squinting at? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Now, the game can be more complex by adding in a bunch more characters. Uh, each side has some animal characters that you will have on the board. Why do you have these animal characters? Because you move around, you're going to pick two of the three animals. Once you see your opponent's two animals, you know which guard they're in love with. So if they like the fox, and the, if you see the fox and this, you know they're in love with this big bald guard. 
if you want these two, you know they're in love with the skinny dude. Huh. And that makes the game slightly more complex, and you have two people with mirrors. Uh, when Melanie and I played it, we definitely preferred it the more advanced way. But overall, the game was just okay. It was decent. It's an interesting concept, and there's certainly some give and take, but it's basically you're just moving pieces around randomly, trying to be like, I move this piece up, and it's just, you know, you're like, oh, I wonder what that piece is, and you're like, oh, nothing, you know. It's nothing. <laughs> but, you know, if you just start marching your princess to the other side, not knowing which guard is, is that you need to get to is important. I think you need to play advanced just so it's you move around a little bit more. Otherwise, you run the princess for the opponent's guard, they every you move a piece next to the guard. They're like, this is definitely the princess. Nope, it's not. I lied. Now the princess moves twice, and I got you. Yeah. So the basic game's a little too blah, but the full game is better. I enjoy it, and I really have to say, I love the concept. Like I love the, like using this mirror to look through the other side. I don't know why that. Oh, now I got it. Wait, hang on. I, I know what I was doing wrong. It, it's hard to do this stuff like in. You know, through a thing. Through a thing, yes. Through a glass darkly. So you have this guy here, and you can you can see him. And when you look, oh, whatever. It works. <laughs> it works. Is this this is this what production on your videos is like, right, Tom? Where I just throw things this, aside. This is all the all of the uh, the the outtakes. See, it works like no, it doesn't. Ah, rage. It takes like eight takes. Okay, let's see. Uh, I don't think we have any uh, questions about that one. Needs lasers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a cute thing, and I think it especially work well for kids, too. Okay. Again, I, I like the idea of it, and it works fun. So that is, and how well are the pieces constructed? Well, I mean, you've been seeing some actual yeah. um, demonstrations of that, but they seem pretty good. All right, let's see. Here we go. Ready? Plastic on the bottom. <laughs> Looks fine. Let's try it again. We'll try it all the way to the floor now. I... Oh, golly. That sound. Sturdy. Okay, cool. Are you going to do this every episode? I'm answering the questions, Eric. Because that sound is a little startling. I think you gave a lot of people a heart attack just now. Okay, so... Let's get to your last game. Okay. Uh, this is one from Level 99 Games. It's called Resistor. Kind of an unusual packaging because the uh, the box has a hole in it. Um, that's because when you set it up... Wait, I just talked about a game of holes in. Yeah, well, you actually plug the deck in like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, it sits yeah, there. Yeah. And then, so you've got these cards. Um, and the reason they're in that holder is so you can't see them. You can only see the very top of the card at first. Um, they all have paths that are red and blue. This is a two-player abstract game. Um, and the paths sort of work their way along two tracks, basically. Uh, and each player has a base. Uh, you're, you're playing supercomputers, and you're trying to hack each other. That's the theme. It's abstract. Uh, so you've got a base card that looks like this. And then you have a string of seven of these path cards leading to the other player's base. And the object is to make a line from your base to the other base of your color, and that tags their base, takes away one of their hit points, and you're trying to do that four or five times in order to win. Um, you then have these action cards, which I think I put down over here. Here we go. Um, you've got a switch out card, which each turn you're going to you do all of the actions available. Then you flip them over, and once you're done doing all of them, it's the other player's turn. So it's red, and then I flip this over to blue, and then once all of them have flipped over to blue, it's blue's turn to do the thing. Hey, it's a child. Um, I love you too. Good night. So, uh, like, switch out lets you take one of the, the path cards that's on the board and switch it with one of the ones in your hand. You are also holding these cards... Um, Kind of like some other games that we've we've seen recently. You're holding them like this. I get to do what's on these sides, but you can choose my cards and do what's on these sides. Yes, you could take my card if we were actually here. Um, so each card means something different to different players. Uh, so switch out lets you flip out one of those cards. Lock down uh, is an advanced rule that I totally recommend you play with. That locks down one of the uh, the register cards um, as long as it has both colors on it. You can't lock down one that's just your color, but it helps you secure a, a particular route. Um, 
flip over because the cards are two-sided. You can flip over the cards and that changes what's on them, but you don't necessarily know what's on them. So there's sort of a memory aspect to it as you're flipping them over, um, remembering what was there. Does that help me if I flip this back over? And then there's a, a draw and trash action where you draw one of the cards from the deck and then uh, get rid of one of the cards in your hand. Once you've done all of these actions, it's the other player's turn and you continue. Um, until somebody's tagged the other side a certain number of times. There's also these resistor cards that cause you to heal yourself if you got a path all the way back from the resistor that you've discovered or placed on the board all the way back to your goal, you heal. Um, but it also reduces the size of the board. So now you're playing with six cards and then you're playing with five cards and it makes it easier to tag and score. Um, visually, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it, I like the aesthetic. Uh, it's it's an interesting abstract. I felt like if you're playing the basic game, it's almost too basic, too luck-based, depending on what cards you draw, if it's helpful to you, if you're almost tagging your opponent uh, and can just do it within one move, then you're going to score on your turn. And if you get more than two moves away from scoring, it's very hard to actually score because your opponent is going to counteract what you're doing. Uh, so that I found a little frustrating. The advanced game's a little bit better because you can lock down certain registers. Um, but I didn't find it as engaging as I was hoping I would when I first got a look at it. Uh, so it's only a halfway thumbs up for resistor from level 99 games. I think I might like it a little better than you, but I think I like the theme, even though I know it's abstract, but yeah. the only thing someone, someone said here, if it doesn't work, you blow in the cards. Um... <laughs> This, this certainly looks like an NES cartridge right there. This is one of the lockdown cards. All right, well, there you go. All right, folks, those are our, our games that we're talking about today. So now we'll get into our discussion topic of the day, which is cons, kind of, sort of. I mean, um, well... Cons! Originally, we were going to talk about Gen Con, and that was three weeks ago. It, that was the plan. It was a lot more current. I get it, yeah. Ah, well, the hurricane came through and so on and so forth. Um, so, well, let's... We, we actually, we've been saving our Gen Con recap for this point. Um, so let's talk about Gen Con first. Uh, the, every, the first thing everyone talks about with Gen Con is the size. Now, I didn't feel that they released the numbers and they basically said that there was more turnstiles than ever before. It was up by a small percentage. And then they said for approximately 60,000 people, which right. means less than 60,000, because they would use the word over 60,000 <laughs> if it had gone over. Yes. Yes. So actually, it seems like there was fewer total people than last year, but almost everyone who came, came for the whole time. That's the impression that I got, and that's the impression that I felt when we were there. It felt crowded the whole time. Right. Like, did you did you feel like there was ever a point where it wasn't crowded? Well, no, and I, I think that's the idea. Because it's sold out, because they capped attendance for the individual days, every day felt the same. Uh, it used to be that you'd have Thursday was big and then Friday would lull a little bit. Saturday was huge and then Sunday would drop off. But now I think a lot of people who tried to get Saturday tickets couldn't get them and then said, well, I guess we'll go Friday then. So now it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and it, so it felt even the entire time. I don't think it felt more crowded, but it felt always crowded. Someone said that they smelled like they were there the whole time. Actually, no. You know, that's kind of a, a thing that people hear about conventions, but I don't really have that kind of problem at most conventions. And if you do, it's like a, a person here or there. But the I, I, I enjoyed Gen Con. I'm glad it doesn't grow any bigger. I understand that more people want to go, but it is exhausting, and there's just so much. The hotel situation is bad. But the city itself, yeah. I still can't – I still – I go to a lot of cities that have conventions in them, and no city treats convention goers as nice as the restaurants and areas surrounding Gen Con. Oh, yeah. Like, we went to the, uh, there was the soda store, Rocket Fizz, that we like to visit in the Monument Circle area. And they, one, knew exactly what was going on. Guys, that they didn't have everything that people wanted. Three, said they were getting new things throughout the weekend to show. Like, they knew what they were dealing with, and they were ready for it. Say that again? <laughs> they knew what they were dealing with, and they were ready for it. Okay. So, yeah, um, the, the so the, it was bigger, right? Our booth was great. We had a ton of people. We were never bored at the booth having people come by. We saw a lot of games, and 
because the industry is the way it is and because the dice tower is the way we are now very rarely do we go to i guess if there's one thing i regret about gen con is we're not really surprised anymore i don't walk up to a booth and be like what we because bgg has such good listings and everyone knows what's coming there's mm -hmm. not and i wish we could because like the number two question we get asked other than are you having a good day is what's the surprise game of Gen Con? And we're like, um, well, we already told you <laughs> in our top 10 anticipated yeah. games. It, I mean, it's not because we're trying to be jerky about it, but there just really isn't a lot of surprises. That being said, there was one surprise that I found there, and that was how the games sold out. I think I've never seen so many games sell out at a Gen Con. Really? Well, um, I mean, and not just like, oh, we had 50 copies and they sold out. We're so popular! Which happens a lot, <laughs> um, but no, like I think there was like 600 copies of uh, um, photosynthesis, and that sold out. Oh. Um, yeah. Vi I know viral sold out 300 copies, so they had to go get more. And and the Sheriff of Nottingham expansion 500 copies sold out. Um, the Clank in Space sold out. Um, Twilight Imperium 4 sold out. Uh, there was just game after game. I would I was, and all the publishers were like sitting there like. Yeah, I'd be like, so how has your day been going? And they were just like, yes, so good. Everyone was super. I mean, on the publisher side of things, people came to that convention with their wallets open. They were like, I want to buy stuff. I mean, it was crazy in that regard. It was almost yep. close to the nonsense that is at Essen. Yeah, and, and I did hear a number of those sellouts, like you said, got more shipments in later in the weekend and, and were able to sell even more. We, we sold out, we got another overnight shipment, we sold out again, we got more, now we're done. That I heard that a lot. You mentioned surprises, though. There, we did have a little bit of a sense of surprise in the week leading up to Gen Con with the announcements that one, Twilight Imperium 4 would be sold at the show, and two, yeah, uh, Plat had announced Stuffed Fables the week before Gen Con, which to me was a big surprise. I knew nothing about that one. Yeah, okay. I'll grant you that. And that's why, I, actually, Stuff Fables was the game I told people about. It's just that you couldn't buy it there. But I think for once, Eric and I are completely synced on how frothing we are at the mouth for a game. Because <laughs> Eric likes my Mystics way more than I do. I like it, but Eric, uh -huh. you know, he's married yeah. to it secretly. Um, but the, the Stuff Fables looks like it's way better. I mean, for me, the theme of toys fighting evil is really cool. I really like that theme. The miniatures look great. And the book! It's a book that turns pages and... Uh, ah! The whole thing. And then the uh, price yeah. point. It's phenomenal. I don't know how they're pulling this off. I'm excited. Um, the, the little minis look fantastic. Uh, the storybook aspect looks great. Uh, it's sort of a streamlined, mechanically game from Mice and Mystics. Um, life points are stuffing. When you run out of life points, the, the stuffy just sort of collapses and needs to get help and restuff. I mean, that's adorable. My son loves Little Stuff Friends, and he is going to be all over this game when it's out. This is the perfect... It's like they made it for me and my kids. I no, cannot wait. They made it for me and my kids, so you just back off! No, me and my kids. Um, so, yeah, so Gen Con overall was a really good time. A lot of great games came out at Gen Con. I couldn't tell you what the... I mean, obviously, the Century Golem Edition was hot. Clank yep. in Space was hot. Twilight Imperium was hot. And you're right, that was a big surprise. Uh, Photosynthesis, Viral. Um, Starfinder, which was the star space version of Pathfinder, <clears throat> yeah. was super hot. Um, remember that Star Trek box we were talking about? I don't. I didn't see that anywhere. Did you go buy it? The Star Trek box? Well, I thought there was like a box that was like the board cube, and you open it up, and there was a bunch of Star Wars stuff in it. Star Trek. I say Star Wars. Yes. Star Star Trek. Um, Star Trek box. Was that? It was a role playing game box. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think I saw pictures, but I never saw it in person. All right. Let's see if we have any questions about Gen Con. I don't see one. Someone asked what we're doing for PAX Unplugged. Well, you know what? I've been working out those details, so I'll talk about that briefly right now. PAX Unplugged. Yeah, I'd love to hear what we're doing. <laughs> we're going to be at the Geek and Sun booth. Geek and Sun makes board game tables, really good tables. So we're going to have a corner of their booth. We'll have a few of our promos with us. Not a ton of them, but a few of them with us. Um, but we're also going to have a pin. Now, Penny Arcade does something called Penny Arcade, where you buy little pins, 
and you can go around and trade them. It's it, they they basically copied the idea from Disney. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so Penny Arcade does the same thing. Well, we're gonna have a pin of that little dice tower guy, um, the one that stands for me first. We and future years we'll do the other guys, as time goes by. If we keep going back to packs. Okay. We have a couple panels. I'm on some industry panel with a bunch of industry people talking about industry. Um, I uh, maybe I should look that up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, still a few weeks to go. You're fine. No, no. Well, there's like two months, isn't it? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe it's a little. It's a little over a month. We got S in first, man. Two months. Two months. Yeah. Blah 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 blah. Okay, so I'm on a panel. It's called State of the Tabletop Industry and Beyond. Mm, beyond. That's at Friday at 12 noon, and it will be Scott Gata, president of Renegade Game Studios, Justin, president of WizKids, Mike Webb. VP of Alliance Game Distri- Distributors, Travis Severance, owner of Millennium Games, and and me. <laughs> I'm bringing down the whole thing. <laughs> um, so that's at 12 noon on Friday. And then on Saturday at 1.30 in the main theater. This is exciting because the main theater there is pretty big. We're doing a top 10 list. <laughs> um, you know what, Eric? I don't know why I didn't put you on this top 10 list. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm running camera. The booth? I'm in the booth. Um, uh, uh, I can edit that up to September 23rd. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm sure that we can get you on there. <laughs> I'm sorry, anyway, sir. We need your ticket. Uh, we're doing a we're doing a top um, we're doing a top ten, and we're probably doing top ten video games that would make great board games. Ah. That's probably what we're doing there. Okay. So, um, that's our PAX uh, plans in a nutshell. Um, the whole thing about going to Shady Maple the day before, that's looking slim at this point in time. That may happen, I'm not sure, just because of timing issues and all. I'm going to try, maybe, but we'll see. Um, maybe the second time we go to PAX, and we'll know more of what <laughs> we're doing. So that's in the future, but even less, even closer to the future. So let's go back to the future. All right, um, is uh, Essen. That's only in a few weeks, so we're excited about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about Essen in our next. Me and Eric talking about stuff, or maybe two from that. I don't know. Okay. But I also went to two other small conventions, Grand Con. That's in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Me and Z went to that one. There was a lot of industry people there, actually. Uh, Richard Lanius, Kevin Wilson, Chris Kirkman. Um, a new company called Orange Machine. Have you heard of Orange Machine? I have not. That's where I got the shirt. No, I didn't get the shirt from them. But uh, Orange Machine is a company started by the Don Eskridge, who designed what famous game? Uh... Starts with an R. It's Republic for, of Rome. It's for four to ten people. R? It's often played at conventions. Jason Levine is not allowed to play this game much. Ratichu? <laughs> is that after you? You were. In, I'm gonna, uh, first, we'll have teach you, but if you don't get it, we'll reteach you. <laughs> it involves team versus team. Uh, night. No, no, there is no night in this game. There's missions. Revolution? No. Resistance. Um, okay. Resistance. That's the most resistance. boring game ever. I gave you lots of clues there. But anyhow, <laughs> someone said yes. werewolf. Um, but anyway. Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, he did the resistance. So he's starting a new company, Orange Machine. And I have the first game from Orange Machine. That they kickstarted it, and it's already finished. I have it downstairs. And I forget. Uh, I'm not, well, it's not downstairs anymore. It's in the the studio <laughs> but i forget the name of it but anyway all his games are going to be four to eight players every single one wow and all are going to be heavy negotiating um like back and forth like that sort of game not necessarily social deduction but definitely a four to eight player experience with a lot of interaction that's really interesting because that's such a a good focus i like a company that comes out with a focus so many companies come out and you're like so what What's different about your company? They're like, we're going to make good games. <laughs> Thanks for that obvious stuff yeah. there, Captain. Um, 
but you know i like that this focus so we'll see we'll see he's gonna design a lot of these games we'll we'll see how they are I'm, I'm i'm kind of interested to test out the first one but anyway grand con was a very small intimate con i would say it's hard to gauge how many people were there like at any given like it was like uh friday saturday sunday it was really <laughs> like that and i got to play a lot of games there met a lot of great people z and i did a panel there and then this last week i went to HowCon, which was in halifax and that was like a science fiction con. There was more people cosplaying there than there was at Gen Con. Wow. And it was a tenth of the size. But there was just a lot of cosplay, a lot of good cosplay. And that was fun. Okay. And then they had, a, they had a gaming room downstairs. And so I just went down and played games. I did a Wits and Wagers game. And me and Rodney did a panel on... Rodney Smith was there, because Canadian. Um, and <laughs> we did a, a panel on how to deal with problem gamers in the game group. Okay. So that was a lot of fun, both of these conventions. Um, Did you meet my friend Steve at, at Grand Con? No. He didn't come up and say hi? Well, it's possible. What did Steve say? I don't know. Oh, this is the guy who used to know you. Yeah. Well, he still knows me, but yeah, he was my friend growing <laughs> up. Yes. Yes. Th really? I think so. He didn't well, come did say he? hi? See, now I can't remember if you told me. Did you tell me he was going to come to I told him that he was going to come and say hi. So You shouldn't have told me that. It would have been better because now I don't remember right. if you implanted the memory in me. Inception. Um, I don't know. Oh, well. I thought maybe he would have made an impression. Maybe he did. Maybe. Oh, wait. Is that the guy who took us out to eat? His name was Steve. I don't know. Does he have kids? He, yes. Are they teenagers? I, I don't think so. <laughs> this is super exciting. I'm sorry I derailed you. <laughs> Riveting audio <laughs> and video. <laughs> ah. Tom Fink, this is the real Tom Fink segment. I should do that sometime. Tom Fink. And then no, there's like no tagline. And you just sit there and you see me going. Huh. Well... All right. Okay. All right. Anyway, that's anyway. my stupid joke of the day. Okay, so um, we will now take questions from you for the end of the show. We'll take questions for a certain amount of time until me and Eric are tired. Um, so if you guys have questions for us, ask them there. We'll answer a few of the questions here. Um, Eric, are you a Michigander too? Yes, I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, I was there for all of my public schooling from kindergarten through high school. Uh, and, and my family was there for, for many years. Most of my family has moved east, though, so I'm not really... I, I've gotten back to Michigan rarely since then. One big con or ten smaller cons? Oh... I think just for the time management aspect, I'd have to go with the one big con. But it would have to be a con that I get to actually play stuff. Gen Con tends to be a little too big. We have, we have a few too many responsibilities to be able to just really relax and play as much as I'd like. Um, but like maybe a Dice Tower Con. No, Tom no. Realized something. Ah, it's irritating. Someone said, so one of the questions here, I just read it said um uh what do you do with all the boxes you get is it a, is it in the mail is it a pain to throw them away and i was thinking you know, it, it is a pain right because we break them all down and we recycle them and stick them in a recycling bin and at the studio the recycle truck only comes once every two weeks and then that's tomorrow morning and i didn't put out the recycling can so oh. i need to get there early in the morning to get out the recycling can so that that truck comes and takes them because two weeks ago there was a hurricane that didn't come get them so we have a lot of boxes so. This is a real behind-the-scenes peek into the way Tom's mind works. I'm enjoying <laughs> there's, this. There's a lot of these moments during the day where I'm sitting there going, <gasps> but my wife is really bad about it because she'll be like, <gasps> and I'm like, what? She's like, oh, I didn't buy milk at the store. I'm like, that is not the that's, kind of reaction to have not a for, that, for that thing. <laughs> she'll come up to me like, I have terrible news. I'm like, tell me the news first, and I'll decide if it's terrible <laughs> or not. Um... When are you gonna hear my opinions of Seventh Continent Base? That's next week, probably. All right, let's see. What does it take to get Dice Tower folks to attend a con? Whew. That's tough because we get asked that a lot. Um, 
Well, there's a lot. In fact, I think Eric and I were just invited to Iceland. Mm-hmm. And it was like, that'd be cool, right? <laughs> it would be cool. But the, there's, there's, there's a couple factors. One is just yeah, travel. Travel is a factor. Um, so we pay for a lot of our own travel to go to cons, but we can't pay all the time. It's just it's impractical. Um, and lodging, lodging and food. There's just a lot of, of, of expenses. And then time. Eric actually has another job. I know that you guys might know that, but he works in a in a. Is it in a sound booth? Oh, I thought that was a. People have been wondering if that's a torture chamber. They said it looks like the walls might crush you. It's foam. It's I could fall asleep and. No, this is the sound deadening foam. This is the booth. This is where I sit all day and read. It's hot in there, right? I don't know why I decided to sit here, but it's a ventilation system, and I I could open the door if I really wanted to, but. Um, it, it, you know, it's not terrible unless it's like the middle of summer, then it gets really hot in here. Okay. So, so there's that, you know, Eric has a job and he reads books and does other things all the time. So he can take a week off, but he can't do it all the time. Um, and I can't take with, every week off. And the same with me, right? If we went to conventions all year round, that'd be cool, but we actually should review games at some point. And so that takes a lot of work. And because I went to two conventions here, back to back, Grand Con and that, and there was also the hurricane. I'm really far behind now on videos. Now, you'll notice they're still getting up because I'm going to work super early in the morning and recording reviews and trying to catch up. But it th that takes up time. So when we go to a convention, uh, we have to, to somehow justify all that stuff. And I usually work it out with the people who run the convention. So that's what it takes is the person running the convention to get in touch with me, and I'll tell them what it would take for us to come. Not that we're I, – I swear we're not trying to be um, greedy about this at all. We're not trying to, you know – act like big shots not at all if we come to convention we're gonna do our best to make that convention an enjoyable time for everyone who's there and if that involves me staying away from you to make your time an enjoyable time we'll do it but we just have to do that because otherwise it would be impractical have you ever yeah. complained about your favorite author not finishing a book series because they're always going to conventions you know people are always yeah. like say let them you know let them alone that's not that's not the reason I, I i guarantee you if they're going to conventions all the time they're not getting much writing then yeah, because going to convention t sucks up time. When I go to a convention, I'll come back and I'll be like, "Oh, my emails have piled up. Yeah. All this other stuff has happened." So, so what you need, Tom, this is this is something to think about for the future. Is is like a bookmobile, but for games, like a mobile studio that you can drive around the country from convention to convention. You can work during the week, and then the weekends you will have arrived at whatever event you're supposed to be at. Uh, and and you you can get all the work done, get a nice like satellite internet connection, and you'll be all set, and and that can be your whole year. You just need a second vehicle for your family to follow you around. But you know maybe well, that's the go. second. Year. And you and you just mentioned though the, the the last and probably most important reason we have families. Yes. So my family is okay. I'm I'm here at home a lot, and so they're okay with me leaving. I leave for a week on end, you know, whatever, and I come back, and then we love each other. It's a great time, um, but I'm pushing that right a little bit. Not 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 a lot. It's not like well, there's scary things happening in a vassal household, but I don't want to miss more of my kids' lives. So I have to pick a certain number of weeks a year. I say like ten for me. Ten ten to twelve weeks a year, and a couple of those weeks, I'm, my kids are with me. Like Dice Tower Con, Dice Tower Cruise, uh, which is coming up. Ah! Oh, by the way, there's only thirteen rooms left, folks. I think, or maybe it's we're 14. down to thirteen. It was 15 yesterday, right? Yeah, but we sold three today, probably, and maybe some more. Um, so it's, yeah, the, the people are like, oh, I better get them why I should. Yes, you should have yeah, got them three they months won't, ago, they won't go but whatever. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's find another good question here. Eric, will we get Tom to play Tragedy Looper? Have we already done this? And I just don't remember. I have not played Tragedy Looper with you. That was you a time remember travel. If you'd that was a time. It. That was a time travel joke, Eric. Oh, right. Yes, it's happened. And then just due to the vagaries of the space-time continuum, you don't remember it. Um. Let's see here. I'm looking for good questions. You know. Um. So really, he's saying everybody that all your questions are bad. I'm sorry. It's just an uh, objective. Someone said you should bring sunscreen to the cruise because you look pasty. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my, uh, my my fluorescent light. I need to figure out lighting. 
Uh, this is the wall day, um, but it's not the prettiest lighting. What's the weirdest thing you ever experienced at a convention? The weirdest thing? Um, man. I'm trying to think of cosplay stuff. You think cosplay that's, that's, is the thing that's weirdest? I don't know if that's the weirdest, though. Were you with us the other when we were at Gen Con and we walked down the street and a guy drove by on a bicycle and was like, ah! And then fell off his bike? No, but I do remember that guy. There was a guy who, like, yeah. had bags we had a guy of, that... of cans or something? Yeah, aluminum cans. And he was, he was inebriated and just collapsed in front of us. Um... We helped that him was get up, folks. Less we, we are not. Yeah, we helped him get. We didn't laugh at him. No, we, we we got him back up and got him on his way. But it was, um, that was certainly weird. Well, let's take out the the street people and stuff because that's 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 too. Yeah. Um. Let's let's like at a convention itself. We've had weird questions. We had the weird. We had the guy talk about My Little Pony Scythe. That was a weird moment. Oh, okay. So um, recently at at BGT Con, uh, this last. Yeah, this last year, I had a guy come up for a, a picture with you. And I, yeah, sure, no problem. And right before somebody snapped the photo, this guy slaps up a picture, like a, a mask of me wearing a Jordy mask, which is the Twitter image of the person running the future Eric here Twitter account, which is not me. If you followed this on Twitter at all. I thought it was you in the future. There's a guy. It's you in the future. It's Don't not- ruin it. It's this guy, and so I got to meet him for the first time in the middle of a photograph. That was weird. I like to tell people that I don't control that account as far as I know. All right, Eric says, Eric, if Tom would get a cosplay uniform costume, what do you see him dressing as? Tom, what would Eric do if he dressed for cosplay? Eric Uh, would be like a... To me, Eric would just be a... um, one of those science officers on Star Trek. He'd walk around with the glasses and be like, oh. <laughs> and Captain, and he would. It would be like a perfectly immac- immaculate style uh, uniform. You know, you'd look at him and be like, "Oh, that guy's a, a geek." It wouldn't be, but Eric would just be that. And then when he would talk, you'd be like, "Oh, he's really from the show." No, that's just. I, I would definitely yeah play it up for sure. That's yeah, that's good. I, I, I have trouble thinking of Tom not dressing up like Cardinal Cardinal. Um, Shut up, think, Eric! You're <laughs> ruining the secret. <laughs> like everyone thinks it's a secret. Um, uh, Tom would need to be like the the pillar of attention. Um, maybe maybe Lord Business from the Lego Movie, and he'd just be on the big old stilts and walking around with the flames shooting out of his head. Actually, I want to be the bad guy from the new Lego Movie. The the trailers look hilarious. The, the Ninjago, Ninjago one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, what's your name again? He's like, I'm your son. Lloyd, the first L silent. Yes. <laughs> All right, what's the longest time a game has sat on your re- to-be-reviewed shelf before you reviewed it? Um, it? I'd say once they reach a year, the chance of them being reviewed is almost nothing. So I'll say like a year. I would agree with that. I still try and get stuff if it passed that line, but there comes a point at which there was a reason why it wasn't hitting the table to begin with, and yeah, it's just, it's not going to happen. We're not going to work it into the discussion. All right. Um, I don't know if we'll ever do a, we did a top 10 list on this in the past assembly, but someone said, like, who are your favorite board game artists? Hmm. Um, off the top of my head, I'll say Vincent Dutre. Easily... Probably my favorite. I love his stuff. His Time Story module he did, Prophecy of Dragons, is amazing. <clears throat> that new Rising 5. He really just has good stuff across the board. Uh, Fernanda Suarez, the, the artist that's doing a lot of work with Plaid Hat, uh, she, she did a, a series of Disney princesses recently that made it onto one of the, the aggregator services. She, she sort of made, made the big time or, or got a lot of press for her series of these Disney princesses. She has such a, a realism. There's something about the expressions of her characters that I really like. Um, and for me. Uh, Michael um, 
Menzel, I really like his um, boards. You look at his boards, it's almost like a Where's Waldo type thing. Hmm. You know, I just look at his stuff and it's like, ooh, that's really, really cool. Uh, let me see. I'm looking through some names here. Xavier Gwynefrey Durin, who actually, I believe... Did he do this one? I uh, no, I can't see it. I don't know if he did Princess Jing or not. Oh, no, he did do Princess Jing. This guy! <laughs> um, but he's done the Seasons artwork. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And his yeah, his name is actually... Here it is. It's Nye, Nye, it's it's like a one-word thing. And speaking of one word, Piero is also a great yes. artist. He's the guy who did yes, ghost yes. stories. Really good stuff. Uh, what do you think about... Um, Oh, uh, not, not, um, who's the guy who does Agricola? Oh, yeah, it's not coming off the top of my head, but Clemens, I know that style. Clemens Franz, Clemens Franz, yes, this is yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the interesting thing about Clemens Franz is I like his stuff when it's small. So, like, he does the Agricola okay. cars and Caverna tiles, and he does a lot of these games. Like, he does half yeah, the yeah. lookout stuff, and it looks great. His box covers, when he, like, blows up one of those people, you're like, eh, it's okay. <laughs> I like his small stuff better. Okay. Eric, what are you currently reading in sci-fi? Uh, I am about to narrate the next Castle Federation book. This is one of those big, uh, um, like space operas where you've got a captain and bridge crew and all this stuff. And this is maybe the fifth book in the series. These are probably my favorite styles of books to read. So for some reason, I like the characters. I like the aesthetic of these whole things. So somebody on a starship leading a crew of uh, intrepid adventurers, that's the kind of book I really get excited about. So that that's coming up for me in just a couple of weeks. All right, we'll take uh, two more questions. One, what time period would you like to see added in a new expansion for time stories? Hmm. I mean, we had 1980s already, but I feel like that didn't really capture the yeah. time period. Yeah, I don't think that was a 1980s. Uh, yeah, thing. I mean, technically it was, but it, it really wasn't. So I'd, I'd love to see something with a little more flair in the 1980s. Um, I don't know. I like I like it when it when it travels off into fantasy universes too, uh, and and sort of flip flops what you might expect out of the normal timeline. I like that. Yeah, I agree on that too. But I wouldn't mind seeing maybe like an Aztec thing, like a Indiana Jones time thing, where they're going into the jungles and finding stuff. I, I might like that that a lot. Hmm. Okay, last question. Let's see here. Um, well, this one's about conventions so i'm gonna try to go to my big oh. first big game convention next year origins or gen con eric did you disappear eric has disappeared all right well i'll keep talking while he tries to figure out how to come back <laughs> I'm going to eject him and see if he comes back. Okay, folks. Well, that was exciting. I guess I get to finish this. He has a link to uh, this show, so hopefully he will find that link and come back. But anyhow, uh, so I'll appeal this question. <laughs> Origins or Gen Con? Um, I would say it all depends. Do you want to see big spectacles and see a gazillion game companies? Then you want to do Gen Con. Do you want to play a lot of games and see some companies? Then Origins. Do you want the... I like them both. If I could only go to one, I'd go to Gen Con. But I like Origins a lot. But I like seeing all the publishers. So that wins for me there. Um, okay, well, we still haven't recovered Eric yet. And he hasn't texted me yet. So... Here. Well, he was supposed to close the show out, but then he disappeared. <laughs> Someone thinks Eric's room finally collapsed on him. 
I hope he's okay. I'm assuming he just, uh, uh, let's text him and see what happened here. Hello? So that's how these shows are going to work. <laughs> We're going to start the show, and then Eric will drop out halfway through, and I'll just be left here live by myself. Um, maybe Eric's TARDIS whisked him away to another time. Looks like you have to keep talking until he comes back. Will there be more tickets available to Dice Tower Con next year? Eric's computer died. Ah, did not plug it in. Classic amateur mistake for live Q&A. So he's restarting his computer, then Eric will be back just in time to close this out. So I'll answer a couple questions here while we're waiting. Uh, where's your hat? I took it off because the headphones were getting in the way. And also Eric said it was fading into the background. I could wear this red one here, but it doesn't fit in the headphones, so I have to put the headphones back like this. Oh, wait, when Eric's not here, I don't even need the headphones. So I'm going to take them off. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Any other questions? No. Um, so there will be more tickets available at Dice Tower Con, but not a ton more. Uh, the next Dice Tower Con is going to be July 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, what's the oldest game you still return to play? Probably Ave Caesar. Unless you count hearts or something like that. Um, North Atlantic Seafood versus South Atlantic. That's a tough one. North Atlantic has better scallops. That's for sure. They probably have better lobster. I'm pretty sure. I shouldn't say probably. Their lobster's better. Their seafood soups, seafood chowders and bisque, definitely better. Florida has better shrimp. The shrimp was excellent up north, but I think Florida shrimp is better. And I think I might like Florida fish better, although it's a regional thing. I like fish in both. The, the verdict is this, though. The seafood in both is amazing and delicious. Um, tell us more about the monster who just wants to wear silk pajamas and eat pizza. I, I don't actually, I don't actually get that one. Eric is not allowed to rejoin, apparently. Let me, uh, let me add Eric. I will send an invitation to him. All right, the invitation has been sent. But anyhow, let's see. I'll go back to these while Eric's still trying to join. I'll close the show, says Sam. The Brother Murph brothers are here. Does this feed become a podcast, someone's asking. Well, yes. And if you're hearing this on a podcast, you're like, he's already said that at the beginning of the podcast. You're right. I did. Um, oh, the Great Cart Wars of 1568 with Chief Sokoto. Was it 1568? Hang on a second. No, it was 1643 B. Yeah, that was when the Great Cart Wars were. But it was it was fine. It was uh, Save a Lot versus uh, IGA. But uh, IGA, it, it really, I mean, they started out with Save a Lot as the underdogs. Nope, says Eric, I can't join back up. Well, folks, I guess I'm going to have to end this by myself. It's very sad. Folks, I apologize that Eric dropped that like that and didn't plug his computer in so that it died on him. Eric is a fantastic person, and I wouldn't be able to run a dice tower without him, in all seriousness. He does a great job, and I appreciate him, and I would not want to do a podcast without him. We've been working together for many, many years, and I look forward to doing it for many more years. Folks, thanks for watching the inaugural um, episode of Dice Tower. Oh, Eric's back. I retract everything I just said that was nice about him. Wait, were you just saying nice things about me? I was not. Oh. <laughs> um, 
Are you in a different room? Yeah, I, well, I learned something. My, my computer can't handle a, a, however long we were talking on battery power. Yes, yeah, so I said that while you were gone. A classic amateur mistake. Yeah, I know. Um, well, it dropped pretty quickly. Like, all of a sudden, I was at, like, 45 minutes left, and then two minutes left, and then it shut down. So. Yeah, the streaming really takes it out of a computer battery. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so close us out here so we can end this show. Yeah. Oh, you want to, you want to hear the? Uh, hey, uh, th- thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, promotional cons- consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. If all goes well, Tom and I will see you next week for another installment. Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. The Dice Tower tonight is produced by Tom and me with assistance from Derek Porter and Rob Searing. Those long-term warning cries by small demonic golfers you hear in your ears during the early evening were brought to you by Twilight Imp Ear Eon 4. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at Board Game Geek on Facebook or Twitter or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find something new at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all of us at the Dice Tower, have, have fun, fun gaming. gaming. Hey, now, Eric, let me ask you this. this yeah. I'm still confused about this, okay? So they gave these to me in Canada and said these are Smarties. Yeah. But these yeah. are chocolate. These are M&Ms. I know. This is from an alternate universe. Their, their tartness. And yeah. they became, it's like a, a cross-evolution thing. I keep trying to explain it to foreigners what our Smarties are like, and they're like, so you're saying it's essentially sugar. <laughs> like, no, it's sugar and yeah. food coloring. <laughs> ah, smarties. Who's the uh, smarty? <laughs>